You're listening to the Wisdom for Life broadcast. This is Pastor Glenn here with another episode entitled, Don't Foul Out. Hey, we're going to continue our series here this morning on March Gladness. Part two, we're talking about not fouling out. And our text today is James chapter 1, verse 12. If you want to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1, verse 12. James, Jamaica, James. How many of you know that basketball is not supposed to be a contact sport? If you've ever played the game, you realize it's a contact sport. It is. You want to play the game as hard as you can without fouling out. You all know where James is at, right? Some of you, you're concerning me a bit. (laughs) James chapter 1, verse 12. You want to play the game of basketball as hard as you can and assertively as you can, even aggressively as you can, without fouling out. Now, growing up in my grade school, told you last week, the Door Village Eagles, we went to the city championship. Your pastor, yours truly, was the power forward. We were one of the greatest teams that LaPorte, Indiana, had ever seen. Out of a school of 60 kids, we went all the way to the city champion, city championship game. And here's what happened. I fouled out of that game. I was so excited. I was so intense. How many of you know I'm not intense now? But I was then. I was really intense then. And and uh, so early on in the second quarter of that game, I fouled out. I was slapping arms. I was elbowing. I was jacking people up, man. And here's the deal. I got fouled out of the game. The coach had to bench me. He had to bench me. Why? Because I was playing the game in a way That was incorrect. I wasn't going to, even though we lost that game, I lost early on because I had fouled out. Many Christians are fouling out of their walk with Christ. They are continuing in sin. And the coach has to bench you. There's a moment where God says, you know, you need to sit. You need to chill. You're about to foul out of your walk with me because you're continuing in sin. You're not repenting. A player has up to four, uh, five fouls in high school at the college. But the NBA gives you how many? Six. Six fouls. I wish they'd have given me six. I'd have used them all up. Every single one. Every single one. I want to ask you this morning, anybody get tempted to foul this week? Yes. Oh, the truth tellers are here. Three people. That's great. Everybody else had a perfect week. You were right next to Christ, weren't you? You little angels, you. You are dirty little saints. That's what you are. You're sanctified by grace, but you've got this dirty little thing going on, and you know it. You know it. You've been tempted to foul out this week. It means you're a human being. It means you still have a flesh. We've got to face temptation, though, and resist it to win. We can't foul out spiritually if we're going to finish the game. When we do commit a foul, the Bible is clear about what to do. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says this. Don't turn there. I'll give it to you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, by the way, that was written to Christians. That was not written to the lost. So here is a verse of Scripture saying to Christians, if you do sin, confess. He is faithful and just to forgive. Doesn't that set you free this morning? The problem isn't whether or not we sin. Believe it or not, the problem is is we fail to repent and confess. We go weeks and months and days without ever coming to Christ and saying both that was wrong and then also, God, more than I'm sorry, I'm willing to turn from it. Give me the strength and the power to resist temptation. This is so important to me as your pastor because I want to see every one of you have victory in this area. 
Many of you don't have the victory in your life because you're fouling out. You don't know that all you have to do is come to the Lord. Come to the coach. Confess that sin. Bring it before Him. He's merciful. He's just. He'll forgive that sin. So here's the heavy revy, okay? In the end, it's not the temptation or the sin that benches us. It's the failure to repent. Did you get that? If you're taking notes, that's a biggie. That's the heavy revy. It's the failure to repent. This is the reason why many people are spiritually benched for the entirety of the game. They've just given up on resisting temptation altogether because they believe that it's impossible to beat their sin. I want to tell you this morning, very directly, you can win in Jesus Christ. You can be free. You heard it this morning. By a powerful gift of the Spirit, you can be free in Christ. The chains are unlocked. What did we hear? The bars are open. All we have to do is walk out. You can be free in the name of Jesus. You can be. Now, the devil doesn't want you to believe that. He doesn't want you to believe that you can be free. He would love for you to believe that for the rest of your life, you've got to put up with this dirty stuff. You do not have to put up with the dirty laundry in your life. You can get rid of that stuff. You can get it cleaned. And probably another heavy revy is this. Believing that lie is the real bondage. It's not the temptation itself that binds us. It's believing this lie that says, I cannot be free of it when you actually can. You can be free. You can be free. You can be free. You can in Jesus' name. You can. You can resist and overcome temptation. You can stay in and win the game. Let's look at verse 12 of our text this morning and then we'll pray. It says, blessed. Say blessed. Blessed in the Greek is eulogos. It's where we get the word eulogy. You say that's a death term. No, it's not. Eulogies used to be read to people that were alive. It is a word of encouragement. It is a word of faith spoken over someone's life. It is good news about someone. Okay? A better translation for the word eulogos is happy. Say happy, please. Are you happy this morning? Not if you're living on the bench. I don't care how happy you think your sin is going to make you. I can tell you that over time, very, very quickly, you will sink into depression because that sin will bench you from your dreams, bench you from the things that God has called you to be. The Bible says, happy is the man that endures temptation. The happy people are the ones that are resisting temptation. You say, how in the world could that make me happy? Are you born again? Are you filled with the Spirit of God? There is joy in walking in righteousness. I have to beat up some devils this morning. Some lying spirits that would say, true joy is in doing what the world does. Have you ever found someone in the world that's lost, that's happy? Come on. Come on. As they drink themselves, smoke themselves, send themselves to death, there's not a smile on that face. It says, happy is the man who endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus this morning, I proclaim freedom. I proclaim freedom. I proclaim strength to resist temptation. God, we believe that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we can live and walk in righteousness. God, we give you the glory for that fact. In Jesus' name, and give me a strong amen. 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 The Greek word for temptation is perusmos. It means to be carried away. It means to be literally drug away, picked up and drug away. Ever feel picked up and drug away? Ever feel that way in temptation? Oh, just me. That's what temptation will do. It will attempt to grab you so hard that it, it will grab you and probably pull you by the hair towards where it wants you to be. If you're willing to resist, it will flee from you. The Bible says the devil is a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Resist him and he will what? He will flee. That's a promise. Promises are facts. If you resist the devil, he will go. Temptation will flee. Our first verse here talks about getting a crown of life. In the Greek, this also literally means the good life itself. Do you want to live the good life? Do you want to win the game? Do you want to get off the bench? 
God's saying you can have that, but you must learn to endure temptation. You must resist fouling out of the game. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit this morning. You see, many people are happy and blessed for a short time in sin. How many of you know sin for a season is pleasurable? The Bible says that. Anybody ever enjoy themselves sinning? Even a little sinny. Even a little sinny is fun for a little bit of time, right? But you reap what you sow and you always reap more than you sow and you always reap later than you sow. Sooner or later, what you did in the flesh comes back to you and it's not fun anymore. Oh, and I love that. That's a holy moment when it's not fun anymore. Because now we want to repent. It's almost like the prodigal son that came to his senses, the Bible said. He says, you know what? I'm with the pigs and I'm with the mud and I'm with the hogs and it's not fun anymore. It's better with daddy. I want to be back with dad. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but there's more pleasure in walking in righteousness. So how do I do this? How do I get this crown of life? How does this operate in our lives? James is going to help us face that fact. And here's the first one for your notes this morning. It's be realistic. Be realistic. Be realistic. Be practical. You see, you will be tempted. All of us are tempted. Face it. James 1.13 says, when you are tempted, not if you are tempted. Every one of you were tempted to do something dark and dirty this week. Every one of you. Your flesh smells. The things that you think sometimes smells and stinks. As holy and righteous as you think you are, (laughs) you're not. You're not. God knows better. Face the reality, you will be tempted. Temptations are inevitable. Have you ever met a person who says, I thank God for 42 years, I've not been tempted. That person is a dead man. You are speaking to a dead person. If you're alive this morning and you have flesh, you will be tempted. You will be. And I want to tell you this, (laughs) the more you try to serve God, the more tempted you'll be. It almost seems like on the other side, of serving God and doing the right thing, here are temptations you've never seen before in your entire life. Never forget when I first got, before I got saved, I couldn't get a girl or anybody to open a can of beer to me, ever. After I got saved, sin is lining up at my door. What is the deal? Ever been there? You will be tempted. You say, not me, not me, not me. I get Tickle Me Elmo temptations. I don't get your kind. You get that dark, dirty stuff, not me. Everybody is dark and dirty. Everybody's underwear gets, never mind. (laughs) Stop myself, so don't worry about it. It didn't go. You finished it. At one time, you know, growing up as a kid, as one, at one time I thought, I literally thought that the older you got as a man, as a young man, the older you got, the more you were able to resist sexual temptation. And then I met a bunch of dirty old men in the church and realized <laughs> temptation doesn't change with age either. You're all laughing because, yes, you know it's true. Temptation doesn't have an age limit. You never get too old for it. You know, when I first got saved, I thought I could grow spiritually beyond it. I thought I could pray myself constantly into a place of holiness. And I realized that even when I'm praying, sometimes I'm tempted. Even when I'm worshiping God, sometimes I'm tempted. Even when I'm at church, believe it or not, I still get tempted. Yeah. So is the temptation bad? No. It means I am a human being. It means I'm flesh. It means I fall desperately into the arms of Christ and desperate to the power of the Holy Spirit to help me live and walk in righteousness. Just because you're tempted, tempted, uh, pardon me, tempted, yeah, just because you're tempted doesn't mean you're going to hell. Because you had a fleeting thought, a dirty thought, you're thinking, oh, that's it. I'm not saved anymore. Don't believe that lie. When you got saved, your flesh didn't. Your spirit, your soul are born again. Your flesh is still corruption. It's still dying. It's still with you. In fact, I want to tell you this morning that a majority of the time when you are tempted, it's not Satan, it's your flesh. It's that flesh that has to die. So be realistic. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common. Say common. 
common to man. That means your temptation is nothing new. It's an old bag of tricks. It's been beat before. It can be beat again. You're not especially weird in your temptations. Don't think you're the only one that has ever had a dirty thought or a weakness. It's not a sin to be tempted. It is a sin to give in to temptation. Now, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, Jesus was tempted in all points, like as we, and yet he sinned not. Now get this, he was perfect, yet tempted. So if Jesus was tempted, you will be. I meet a lot of Christians who are intimidated by temptation. They think, oh my gosh, how could I ever have a thought? You ever have a cuss word fly through your head? You self-righteous people are looking around the room. Look at yourself. Someone else has had that kind of a you thought one this week. Everybody else has dirty words in their head. You get them. You get them. Did you say it? No. You beat it. Doesn't mean you're, doesn't mean you're, you're dying and going to hell. It means your flesh, it means, it means that you still got to deal with that flesh. Okay? So even Jesus had to face that kind of stuff. So you know what? This morning, get over yourself. Your temptations are no big deal. Everybody gets tempted. Doesn't mean that you're falling apart. It just means that you're human. Doesn't mean that you're an angel. You know, you're not going to be perfect this side of heaven. Here's the next one. Be responsible. Accept responsibility. Don't blame other people for your problems. You know, we love to blame people, even God. And in verse 13, it says this in James, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. God does not tempt, but we love to blame others, don't we? We love it. We love it. We want to say things like, and I'm going to hit it this morning. Here we go. There is a culture that would say today that in the homosexual community, God made them that way. God made you stupid? Is that what you're saying? God doesn't make anybody stupid. But we do stupid things, don't we? Now, let's not just pick on homosexuals for sexual sin. There'll be a point in your life, if you haven't received it already, you might get hear a wavelength that flies through the sky into your head that says, hey, I'm a guy, and it's okay for me to check out ladies. They are ladies. I like ladies. God made me that way. I'm a lady liker. What, God made you stupid? Stupid, so that any time a skirt walks by you, you're just, oh, uh, I must look at you. God doesn't make stupid. In the words of the great philosopher, Forrest Gump, stupid is as stupid does. That would be the only thing I get a clap for today is Forrest. (laughs) Then we do stupid things like we want to blame our parents. We want to blame the government. We want to blame our spouse for what we do. We want to blame the devil, stupid devil. You're the reason why I'm doing it. The devil made me do it. Yeah, right. You're the devil. Like Satan took a break from deceiving the world just to show up at your house and cause you to watch that thing you shouldn't have watched. Oh, yeah, you're that important. Your own flesh led you there. Own it. Be responsible. I had a guy in church tell me one time, gave me this excuse. God wants me to be happy, Pastor. God wants us all to be happy. I had to divorce my wife and marry this other girl in church. I just had to because God wants me to be happy. I'm like, you're stupid. You're dumb. God doesn't want you to be happy on your own. You don't even know how to define happiness. By wife number two or three, you will learn you can't be happy that way. It's a downhill slope, buddy. But God wants me to, God doesn't want you to be happy first. He wants you to be holy first because He wants to spend eternity with you. He doesn't want you locked up in sin. Don't define what you think God wants for your life. Let His Word direct you. Anything outside of His Word is sin. And we have a direction that that is wrong and it's sin. But I had a man give me that excuse one time. It's just, hey, I gotta be happy. 
I got to be happy. I call that the blame game. I call that excusing yourself. It's called justifying your sin and doing what you want to do and developing a theology that matches what you want to do. Ah, we're excellent at that in America, aren't we? We are great at the excuse game all the way from Adam and Eve. What happened? Adam and Eve in the garden offered an excuse. Adam was the first one and he said, oh, the woman made me do it. And guys, you're still saying that today. It doesn't work with God. It doesn't work with God. The excuses will keep you off the court. I've got a video clip for you to watch on excuses. Let's watch. I'm too weak, too slow, too big. I ate too much for breakfast. Got a headache. It's raining. My dog is sick. I can't right now. I'm not inspired. It makes me smell bad. I'm allergic to stuff. I'm fat. I'm thin. It's too hot. I'm not right. I've got shin splints. Headache. I'm distracted. I'm exerting myself too much. I'd love to really, but I can't. I just can't. My favorite show is on. I got a case of the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday. I don't want to do this. I'm do something else. After New Year's. Next week. I might make a mistake. I got homework. Well, I feel bloated. I have gas. I got a hot date. My coach hates me. Mom won't let me. I bruise easily. It's too dark. It's too cold. My blister hurts. This is dangerous. Ugh, sorry, I don't have a bike. I didn't get enough sleep. My tummy hurts. It's not in my jeans. I don't want to look all tired out. I need a better coach. I don't like getting tackled. I have a stomach ache. Not the athletic type. I don't want to get sweaty. I have better things to do. I don't want to slow you down. I have to do this as soon as I get a promotion. I think I'll sit this one out. And my feet hurt. God is sick of your excuses. When He's given you the power of the Holy Spirit to win, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. I want to challenge you this morning before we move on to the next thought. Do this. Crucify every excuse. Nail every excuse to the cross. Be responsible for what's going on in your head and your heart. You own it. It is yours. Crucify every excuse that has set you free to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what God has called you to do. Here's the next one. Be ready. It helps us with temptation to be ready. We've got to be prepared for it. In Peter, it says, be alert, be on guard. Then it says the devil is a roaring lion seeking who it may devour. Be ready, be alert. Jesus said, watch and pray that you you enter not into temptation. Paul put it this way, put on the whole armor of God. Then when you've done all to stand, Stand. I love that comment says stand twice. It means that when you're at the very end of your rope, keep standing. God's there. Be ready. Temptation is coming. You've got to be spiritually ready for you, ready for it. Many times it catches you by surprise. We're the most vulnerable when we've had a little bit of success. We think that we're doing okay because some things happen that were, that are great in our life. But the Bible says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It makes me think of a man by the name of Bobby Leach. I visited Niagara Falls one time. The story is there if you ever happen to go there. Bobby Leach was a guy who went over Niagara Falls. If you remember, he went over it and it, he just had this uh, this container that he built and he survived it only to a week later slip on an orange peel and die. Many of you have gone over Niagara Falls and said, I made it, I made it, I made it. And the devil says, you made it, huh? Oh, you think you're, you think you're so strong. There's a little orange peel. Jesus said it's the foxes that destroy the vine. It's the little things many times that we miss. We're so prepared for the big things that we miss the little things.